Hello there, and welcome to Central Community Church. My name is Jeremy, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. If you're new to Central, we would love to get to know you. You can scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen, and it will take you directly to our online connecting form. Or if you don't have a QR20 code reader, you can visit central365.org slash welcome. Fill that form out, and we'd love to get in touch with you. Another great way to get connected is to come and attend one of our in-person services. We are now meeting in person every Sunday morning without any public health restrictions in our Chilliwack, Agassiz, and Lake Eric campuses, and our Promontory campus will be starting up shortly. We'll be wrapping up these online services soon, so please come and re-engage in our in-person gatherings. You can visit our website for full details, including service times. At Central, we exist to be authentic followers of Jesus who lead others to follow Him. Part of following Jesus is to publicly confess our faith in Christ and follow Jesus' example in being baptized. We are so excited to once again celebrate baptisms in person. And so we want to invite you to come out and join us at Rendell Park on Harrison Lake on Thursday, August 26, as six believers take the next step in their spiritual journey and are raised to new life in Christ. Baptisms start at 6.30 and you can arrive anytime before then. Parking is available at the Harrison campus and it's a short walk from there to Rendell Park. Feel free to bring lawn chairs, beach blankets, or just sand. And stay tuned, we may have some treats available afterwards at the Harrison campus. Beyond attending, we would love for you to pray for those getting baptized. Even reach out to them and encourage them. I'm sure they would love to hear your support. If you'd like more information about our baptisms, please visit central365.org slash raised. This morning, I'd like to say a big thank you for your faithful giving to Central. We probably don't say this enough, but it's because of you, church, that we, the pastors and staff here at Central, are able to serve our communities, you, the church, and ultimately our Lord Jesus, with our undivided full-time attention. So thank you for your generosity allowing to serve in this way. If you'd like to give to the ministry of Central so that together we can continue building the kingdom of God here in the eastern Fraser Valley, you can do so through our website, app, online banking, or in person. As we move into a time of prayer today, we want to pray for the families at Central that are raising either adopted or foster care children. In the few weeks that I've been at the church so far, I've already heard of many families selflessly raising non-biological children to show them God's love and to raise them in His ways. So let's pray for them and pray for our service this morning. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for who you are and for the way in which you've loved us and you've raised us out of our sin through your death and resurrection, Jesus. Father, thank you for the chance to, to worship you, uh, to hear from your word, Lord. Uh, we pray for Pastor Jonathan as he preaches from Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, bless the words of his mouth, God. Would you challenge us and convict us through Pastor Jonathan and through your word. And Father, this morning we also want to lift up uh, all those families that have adopted or foster children. God, thank you for uh, the ways in which they are loving on these kids, God, and seeking to lead them to you. We pray that you would grant them much strength and grace and patience. And Father, where there are families still working on adopting children and going through some of that paperwork. We pray, Father, just for your favor, God, and that all those things would work out and line up and that those children could be placed uh, in loving Christian homes. God, it's, it's such a privilege to know you and to grow in relationship with you. And we pray that that would be the result of this morning and ultimately that you would be glorified. We love you and pray these things in your name. Amen. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? that you could see it all made new we do is all created 
creation groaning is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is is it good that we remind ourselves of It is good to be here with you all. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Jonathan. I am the Promontory Campus Pastor. And uh, b- before we get into our sermon today, I-, I need to start off actually just by saying thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I-, I asked if you would pray for our Promontory Campus, that we'd be allowed back into our, our building up in-, up in the school in Promontory. And it was less than a week after I asked you all to pray for us, that I actually got an email saying we are confirmed to go back into the school this September. So thank you so much. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Uh, it's incredibly meaningful, and, and we're, so, we're so glad. We are officially, uh, Promontory Campus is heading back up the hill August 22nd. August 22nd, we're gonna be outside on the field, just beside the school, uh, with, with uh, getting ready for our launch in September uh, on the 12th, which is our kickoff Sunday. So if you are part of the Promontory Campus, let me invite you now uh, to come on to the field and, and celebrate worship with us. It's gonna be a wonderful time. 
bring a chair, bring a lawn chair, camping chair, whatever you've got, something to sit on, uh, and, and we're going to have an amazing time on the field, in our community, uh, and getting ready for the fall. So uh, thank you so much for all of you who've been praying for us. Thank you for your support. Uh, I would ask, would you continue to pray? Pray that we would be able to have an impact on our community and that the gospel of Jesus would be heard. All right. Well, with that said, let, let's jump into our, our sermon, our passage here today. We are continuing on with our series, uh, looking at the major prophets. We looked a little bit at the minor prophets. Now we're looking at some of the major prophets. And so you can find your way to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter one is where we're going to be. As you find your way there, I, I'm not sure how many of you have ever learned a, a programming, a computer programming or coding language. It's one of those skills that I, I've always thought is just incredibly useful. Really, no matter what field you're going to go into, basically every job nowadays uses computers. You can't really get away from it. And so having some idea of, of how computers work, function, how they, how they operate, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I genuinely don't really know. I don't know how all of my computer works. I know how to use it, but if anything goes wrong, I, I'm really hopeless. And so it's one of those skills I've always thought is just incredibly helpful. It, it, if you put the effort in, it's going to pay off, right? It, it, it's one of those things that, that is going to be worth the effort, right? And, and like I said, if you put me down in front of some computer code, it would just be absolute gibberish to me. It'd be nonsense. I, I have no idea what all the symbols mean and all of that sort of thing is trying to communicate to me. But I think if you put in the effort, it is worth it in the end, right? It's really like most things in life. If they're going to be worth uh, your time, it's going to take effort to get there, right? Well, that is really my, my hope and my prayer for our passage this morning. All right, our passage this morning, it might start out looking a little bit like gibberish to us. It's a confusing passage off the top, but, but my prayer and my promise to you is if you put the effort in, if we actually work through it, it's going to be well worth our time. Right? Ezekiel chapter 1 is, is really one of these passages, if you read through your Bible, you probably have read and simply gone, huh, don't know what that means, and moved right along. Right? I, I probably wouldn't even fault you for doing that. It's, it's a confusing text, and yet it contains some glorious truths that are so well worth the time and effort to mine into them. So, so today, that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look into Ezekiel and, 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 um, and mine out what God is telling us in this book. Right? If you're familiar with the book of Ezekiel or the prophet, you'll, you'll know he is prophesying during the time in, in, in the life of the nation of Israel when Judah has been taken off into exile. Right? Last week, we looked at the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesies before the exile. Right? He's kind of looking forward and warning the people about what's going to happen. Jeremiah then comes next in the major prophets, and he kind of says, look, this is what's going to happen. And he actually watches the exile happen and Jerusalem be taken over. Ezekiel then comes five years after they've been taken into exile. That's when Ezekiel comes onto the scene, and he begins to prophesy in one of the, the darkest moments of the life of this nation, right? This is, this is a horrible time. They're not even in the promised land anymore, and yet it makes the message of Ezekiel stand out because as God reveals his, his mercy to them, it shines out and, uh, against this, this black backdrop of everything else that's been going on. And so Ezekiel begins with a vision of God. It's a vision of God that's, that's quite unique amongst the, um, amongst the prophets. And so we're going to read our text here this morning. So if you have a Bible, let me invite you uh, to open to Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to read through uh, most of this chapter starting in verse 4. And as I do, I, I want to encourage you to, to begin to try and form a picture in your mind of what Ezekiel is describing. Right? It's going to be a couple different scenes that Ezekiel is going to describe for us. And so try and picture it in your mind as I read through this. And then we'll talk and we'll work through this passage together. All right? You ready? Here now, brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. It says, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. 
And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and, there was, and this was their likeness. They had a human likeness. But each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot. They were sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had a face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, and their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of, of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, they went. And when the wheels rose along with them, for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse shining like awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings." And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire and seated above the likeness of the throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And upward from what had appeared of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him, like the appearance of the bow that is on the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. That's as far as we'll read today. All right. I said this was going to be a bit of a confusing text, and hopefully you're all now confused, right? All right. But my, my encouragement is stick with it, all right? If we, if we work through this, I think it's going to be worth it in the end. Because this is a description Ezekiel gives that actually tells us a great deal about who God is, right? Ezekiel has here two scenes that he is describing. One is sort of this scene down below on earth with these four creatures and wheels and all kinds of things happening. And then there's a scene up in heaven and, and a throne, and so we're going to look at both of these scenes and kind of just slowly work together, make sure we understand what's going on here, because the scene below shows us God's presence that is always with us, and the scene above shows his sovereignty and his mercy towards us, all right? So let's work through each of these scenes. I'll start just with the scene below, all right? The whole book begins by telling us that Ezekiel is sitting uh, by a river in Babylon, right? He's in exile, and as he, as he is looking out, God gives him this vision of this cloud coming forward. Verse 4 says, I looked, and behold, stormy wind came out of the north great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. Right? We're introduced to this massive storm rolling down towards Ezekiel, and there's, there's fire and lightning shooting out from it. And as this tempest sort of comes down on Ezekiel, we're meant to understand this is the presence of God. 
In fact, we've seen this kind of thing before in, in the Old Testament. If you remember, you know, when, when's the last time we've seen God uh, represented as a cloud and fire? Well, it's when God delivered his people out of Egypt. As he brought them into the promised land, God appeared as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We're, we're meant to understand here that, that God is going to continually lead his people. It's no coincidence that Ezekiel is not in the promised land at this point. As God appears to them, he will lead his people once again. But that's really just the beginning, isn't it? Because Ezekiel launches into this long description of these four creatures, right? They all have four faces and, and, and four wings and these legs that are, that are straight down. And we're kind of left to wonder, what on earth are we supposed to be picturing here? I mean, what is the purpose of all of this? Well, let, let's just start by taking the faces. And, and we're going to begin to see that the descriptions usually have meaning behind it. Ezekiel is actually trying to tell us something about God in these descriptions. So let's start just with the faces. We're told that, that each of these creatures has four faces, one of a human, of a lion, of an ox, and of an eagle. And if you think about it for just a little bit, this is really, these are the, the, the crowns of creation, right? The lion is, is the king, right? The ruler of all the wild animals, the ox was the greatest, the biggest, the strongest of all the domesticated animals. Eagles ruled over the skies. And in fact, when God created Adam and Eve, he called them to reign over all creation. The picture here that we're meant to understand is these four creatures represent the highest beings of all creation now acting in service to God. We're told they had four wings. Two, they covered themselves, and two, they, they flew with their wings stretched out so that they touched each other. Now here, if you're anything like me, right, you're kind of picturing in your head, okay, there's sort of these four creatures all in a line, all in a row, kind of, kind of zooming around. But actually, if you pay attention to the way it's worded, and, and I'll be honest, I missed this when I was first reading it, they all are touching the wings of another. Actually, they're making something far more like a square, right? They're, they're all touching the two wings, each other. And so it makes sense that they don't have to turn as they go. They're, they're always facing in whatever direction they are going, right? That's why their legs are described as, as straight, right? See, our legs, our, our feet, they have directions, right? We, we tend to go in whatever direction our toes are pointed. That's the way we work best, but the whole point of these creatures is that they can go in any direction. There is no backwards for them. They don't have to, they're never caught off guard, right? There's nothing behind them because everything is in front of these creatures. The whole point is that they can go in any of the four directions, north, south, east, west, doesn't matter. They can go there and they don't even have to turn as they go, okay? So we're all together so far. We have these four sort of angelic creatures all in, in a box zooming around on this sort of plane stretched out before Ezekiel. But then we're told that each of these creatures have a wheel, right? So, so below each of these creatures on the side, there, there's a wheel for each of them. And then we're told that there's a wheel within a wheel. And we're kind of left to wonder, okay, again, what is being talked about? The first thing that came to my mind, which again was wrong, was something like gears, right? I don't know if maybe that came to your mind, maybe it didn't, but I always had in mind gears or something like a bicycle gears, right? The spokes all going down. Again, actually, the, the answer here is actually even easier. Ezekiel here is describing a, a wheel kind of like this and a wheel going this way, right? So the result is something like a sphere, Right? It was so that these wheels could go in any direction without having to ever turn around. That's the whole point of, of this whole moving sort of palisade going around God's creation. And then we're told, of course, the wheels are covered with eyes. This is the weirdest description in my opinion because I can't understand. Are, are there eyes actually on the wheels sort of getting squished as it goes around? I'm not sure, but I think the meaning here is pretty clear, isn't it? The meaning here is as these, these creatures, these servants of God can move in any direction so they can see in any direction. There is nothing outside of their sight. God has taken notice of all things. And so what we're kind of building here in our minds 
is beginning to look, well, a little bit something like, like almost like a vehicle or, or a chariot of sorts, right? With these wheels and this, this platform that they're forming with their wings all around, moving around, around in any direction as God is directing. Twice in verses 12 and then 20, Ezekiel mentions the point that these creatures and wheels, they don't move on their own, but only as the Spirit directs. And if you look with me at verse 13, I I think this begins to bring all the pieces together. Verse 13 says, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. Later on in the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, I think it's verse 20, Ezekiel says, The creatures that he saw here are actually the cherubim. These are the same creatures that are depicted on the Ark of the Covenant whose wings stretch out and where God himself would sit in the temple in the Holy of Holies. See, what Ezekiel has been building here is the place where God himself sits, except it's not in the temple. In fact, if you continue on in verse 13, uh, Ezekiel says, there is something like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. So in the middle, in the center of this square, we find there is a torch burning, flashing out, you know, fire and lightning. In fact, if, if you can remember back to Genesis 15, it's exactly how God appears before Abraham as he makes his covenant with him as a burning torch. See, what Ezekiel is describing for us with these creatures and these wheels is the picture of God's presence among his people, of God's presence actually moving all throughout the earth in any direction that he so chooses, God is going there. He doesn't even have to turn around. There is nothing that God does not himself see or is able to go to. He rides upon the crown of all creation and nothing escapes his notice or his gaze. Essentially, Ezekiel here is describing God's temple moving. And and here's why that's so important, right? Why does God choose to reveal himself in this way right now? Well, it's because the people of Israel they were not at the temple. In fact, the temple at this point had been destroyed. But the whole point is that God is not confined to a room. God is not stuck or stationary. He's not tied to one plot of land, but God's presence moves everywhere as he wants like a fire or a flash of lightning. God is not restricted by anything. See, this is why Ezekiel's building this picture of these creatures that go in any direction. Why? Because God's presence goes everywhere. There's nothing restricting or hindering him. He is able to go anywhere he wants. See, I said it's a picture worth looking at. And, And here's why. This is the lowest of the low of the moments in Israel's history. They're cast out of the promised land. They they aren't there. They're far from home, but the picture is God is not far away. Even though they have been, they are left, God has not left them. See, that's always the picture with God. He is present with his creation. God's presence is not restricted by anything, not then and not now. Do you think your trial or your trouble is too far from God's presence? or that you have escaped his notice. No, God is not far away, but is near with us each and every moment. You cannot outrun the presence of God any more than you could outrun the flash of lightning. God does not forsake his people, but he is present with them. That's why David writes in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Why is God able to help? Because he is there with us all the time. You will never on this earth go beyond the presence of God. In fact, God doesn't even have to take time to get to you. Nothing stands in God's way. The chariot of God moves throughout the earth and he doesn't even have to pull a U-turn, right? Ezekiel describes 
the scene below as a picture of God's immediate presence with his people. Nothing has escaped God. No trial, no sorrow, God has not seen. But of course, this, this isn't the end of the picture. Ezekiel transitions from the scene below to the, to the scene above of God's sovereign rule over all things. Ezekiel begins to describe sort of as he's backing up this, this expanse that he sees over their heads or the sky shining like crystal. And here as, as Ezekiel is kind of being drawn backwards and upwards, he hears the sound of these creatures rushing by him like the sound of rushing waters, right? Not, not a babbling brook. Like if you've ever stood beside Niagara Falls and you can barely hear for the deafening noise of the water rushing down. He says it's like the, vo- like, uh, like the sound of the Almighty, like an army marching. I don't think that last one was a throwaway line. This was written to a people who had just lost a war. And God is reminding him that his very presence is greater than any army. And as the camera continues to pan back further and up, we see this throne sitting on top of the world. And sitting on the throne, Ezekiel says, is the likeness of a human. Verse 27, he says, he says, and upwards from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. Right, Ezekiel describes this person with this gleaming metal torso and, and, and legs of fire. The whole description is one of just brightness and radiance. It would have been hard for him to even look at. Yet that's how God is described all throughout the Bible. Exodus chapter 24 it says, Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews simply declares, for our God is a consuming fire. The constant picture of God is one of fire, something that both warms and brings light, yet can also burn and even destroy. See, I think that's something of how we ought to think of God. He is both our refuge and our strength, yet no means has he given up his majesty or his might. Right, I love the... the, description that C.S. Lewis gives to Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia, right? It's often been, been talked about and for good reason. Lucy, when she figures out that Aslan is a lion, becomes very nervous about going to see him and she asks this question, is he quite safe? And the response that she gets back, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. See, I think that's the image that Ezekiel sees. This is the picture of God who sits enthroned above the earth, whose spirit moves like lightning cracking across the earth with the sound of armies behind him. He sits on a throne unopposed. There are no other thrones in heaven. He sits there surrounded by an all-consuming fire. And if perhaps Ezekiel stopped right there, we would be asking that question, but is he good? But Ezekiel has one more description. Verse 27, right at the end of verse 27, he says, there was brightness around him, like the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around as God is seated in his majesty and on, in his splendor, in the glory of his throne, on the wall beside him is a bow. Now don't, don't jump ahead too quick here, all right? The, the word that's used here is a, is a bow, as in a bow and arrow, a weapon. This is an instrument of war that is hanging on the throne room of God. It's the same word that is used in Genesis chapter nine. Genesis chapter nine, after the flood with Noah, God makes this promise. He says, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. 
and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This bow is in the sky is a reminder that God has determined not to destroy humanity. It's as if God has taken his instrument of war and he has hung it on the wall because he does not need it, because he is not going to use it. It is the reminder of God's mercy and grace towards all humanity, and that is the symbol that is hanging on the throne room of God even now. As God sits in the splendor of his glory, he sits with the determination of mercy towards us. See, that is the picture of God, a consuming fire fixed on mercy. The one who rules over all the earth, who could bring judgment at any moment, yet has determined to show patience mercy and grace towards us. God will sovereignly work out his mercy on the earth. So is that the picture you have of God? See, I think too often we we get caught up in this idea that, that God is an old man sitting in a rocking chair in heaven, smiling gently to himself, saying, I hope everyone just gets along. That God is really no more than Santa Claus, poses no threat to anyone, just wants people to be nice. But that's not the picture of God. He is one who sits on the throne wrapped in fire. There is something to be afraid of there as he sits in the throne who will judge the whole earth, who will hold us accountable for our sin. Do we know God like that? And do we know this God of mercy? See, we can swing to the other side of the fence and begin to think of God as nothing more than some horrific judge who's only waiting to to absolutely destroy and punish us the moment we slip up. Neither is the right picture of God. What we What we see in the Bible is God is both sovereign and merciful. He is the judge and the one who has taken our judgment. So here's where we need to see, we need to see the one who is on the throne. Ezekiel doesn't go into detail about this this human-like appearance who is sitting on the throne. I'm sure if he had, you know, people would have tried to make an idol and worship it. But that doesn't mean we don't know who sits on the throne. One of the amazing things of sitting on this side of history and, and, and having seen the rest of what God is doing is we actually know the one who is sitting on the throne. We know God got up from his throne and he came down and he, uh, God the Son was born into humanity. That Jesus himself lived and died in our place but he didn't stay dead In fact, he was raised from the dead and raised into heaven that he might sit on that throne once more. And this is where John, as he sees Jesus in heaven, describes him like this. He says, the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. The description of Jesus that John sees in Revelation is the description of God that Ezekiel beholds. Even to the throne itself, again, John describes it in Revelation. He says, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald, still hanging on God's wall is his determination, his reminder of mercy. That's what sits in God's throne room. And sitting on the throne is the reason why. It is because of Jesus. It is because of what he has done for us. He has taken the punishment for our sins and died in our place. The judge has taken the judgment. See, that is the good news of Jesus and that is the picture of who God is. 
do you know God like that? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as your Lord and as your Savior? As the king over all your life? Have you confessed your sins and repented before him because he is merciful and gracious towards us? He forgives our sins because Jesus has taken that punishment on our behalf. That is how we approach God. He is our king and our savior. He sits on the throne and has died in our place that we might be saved. God in his sovereignty is dedicated to showing grace and mercy. See, that's the picture Ezekiel describes for us. And if we put the whole picture back together, we get this beautiful display of who God is, the one who is always with us, who moves to help us like lightning cracks across the sky, who does not leave or forget us, who has not let us go. He is the same one who reigns over all things in consuming fire and yet is bent upon mercy. God's presence among us is good news because he cares for us. Because sitting in his throne room is God's reminder of mercy and grace. Sitting on the throne is the one who died in our place. So the only question is then, what do we do in response? I think we do the same thing Ezekiel did. The very last verse, he says, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and when I saw it, I fell on my face. He falls over in worship to God. What should we do as we behold our God? We answer in worship. We worship together in song. We worship with our lives. We worship with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions. We worship because God is worthy of all that we have. We worship because he is our king and our loving savior. The more we behold the greatness of God, the more we have to praise him and thank him for all he has done. Central, let us do that. Let us worship him together. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful. Father, we are so, so grateful that you have determined to show us mercy and grace. Father, we have not deserved that. We have run far away, but in your your great power and sovereignty, you have shown us mercy and goodness. Father, we praise you. We thank you for what you have done, for who you are, for the greatness of your glory. Father, I pray, settle that into our hearts that we would love to display who you are that we would long to worship you truly and that we would give you all the glory for who you are and what you have done. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Allow me to send you with this final word. Now may the expanse of the glory of God bring you joy in the week ahead. Even in the mundane moments of the day, may the Lord's grand majesty cause you to worship for his purposes are good and his magnificence has no limits. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Have a great week.